our last full day of material um, that we're going to be talking about next class. We're going to be doing some conclusions and thinking about the future of American politics and government. Um, but today we're going to finish our discussion of civil rights um, by looking at uh, the civil rights movements for other groups uh, beyond African Americans and women. Often when we talk about civil rights, these are the groups that we prioritize. But what I'm trying to do with this last class is to suggest that there is also a broader struggles for recognition for many for ethnic minorities, indigenous minorities, as well as sexual minorities. And so it, this class is unfortunately going to be a very, very rough outline of some of these histories. You could teach whole classes on every single one of these movements and these histories, um, but I think it's important to just tell a broader story about the struggles for civil rights in the United States. So we're gonna be looking at uh, indigenous people, LGBTQ folk, and racial and ethnic minorities. And in your discussion post this evening, you're going to think about how these struggles for recognition um, relate to American democratic and Republican ideals. So as we started this class with way back a million years ago in January, um, this the United States uh, as a project was founded upon a, the, the violent settler colonialism of, uh, of Europeans in the North American continent uh, that violently dispossessed an indigenous peoples of their lands led to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of deaths through uh, both outright violence, but also through the spread of disease. Um, that And that this history is not just a history, that this continu it continues to this to uh, affect the, the rights and the, the, the liberties and the, the well-being of indigenous people today. Uh, in the Constitution, um, the federal government was given the exclusive right to negotiate with Native American nations, which were treated as sovereign nations. Uh, but in doing so, this also denied U.S. citizenship to Native Americans. And so much of the U.S., uh, much of the history of uh, relationships between the federal government and Native Americans is the U.S. federal government signing a treaty and then abrogating that treaty provision. In the 19th century, um, it the story of the 19th century is ultimately the story of the forced removal of Native Americans from the East Coast to land to reservation land west of the Mississippi. Uh, in 1830, the Indian Removal Act was passed, which uh, forced the relocation of all Native Americans to west of the Mississippi River. Uh, the Cherokee Nation and Georgia uh, resisted this and, and ensued, ultimately reaching the case. Uh, the case ran it all the way up to the Supreme Court, who in the Cherokee Nation versus Virginia held that Native American tribes were were not sovereign nations, but that they were entitled to their ancestral land. So they didn't have the full territorial sovereignty of a nation state, but they were, uh, they did have legal protections and entitlements to their ancestral land. However, and, uh, Georgia and the uh, President Jackson's administration basically ignored this court order and with the support with the U.S. Army forcibly relocated the Cherokee Nation to what is today Oklahoma uh, during uh, what is known uh, as the Trail of Tears. By the mid-century, most Native Americans were confined to reservation land west of the Mississippi. This land was usually poor, uh, of poor quality of land. It was not particularly arable farmland out in the mountain west in the Great Plains, and this meant that they were uh, many were unable to feed themselves, practice their traditional agricultural and hunting practices since they were in radically different places, and uh, European colonialism radically changed the uh, flora and fauna of the region. Uh, and this poverty left, left many of the Native Americans dependent on the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA, for assistance and support. So they were both dispossessed of their land and less subservient to the federal government. Throughout the 19th century, U.S. settlers in the U.S. Army uh, fought violent conflicts to continue ex westward expansion and settlement into Native American territory and collectively what are known as the Indian Wars. Um, this is not a thorough history. This is just some um, particularly um, important events. On November 29th, 1864, a Colorado militia responded uh, to Native American raids and by massacring 200 Native Americans in southeastern Colorado, known as the Sand Creek Massacre. Following the Civil War, Missouri Gover Governor Philip Sheridan recruited General George Armstrong Custer to prosecute a series of violent wars against the Cheyenne and Arapaho people, uh, which included the killing of hundreds of Native Americans and the destruction of livestock, horses, and ponies that were necessary for survival. Between, uh, be, be, uh, between 1876 and 1877, the Great Sioux War erupted um, in, in the Black Hills region and the Dakotas. Um, the government uh, the uh, once again, George Custer um, was called in to enforce um, 
the basically forced purchase of land from the Sioux. Uh, Sioux and George Custer was uh, brought in, uh, in to fight the main encampment of the Lakota and their allies at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, Custer and his men were separated from their main body of troops, and they were all killed by the far more numerous Native Americans led by Crazy Horse and inspired by Sitting Bull's earlier vision of victory. This was known as uh, Custer's Last Stand in popular Western images. Um, the Lakota also conducted, following uh, this battle, uh, um, in, in 1890, uh, the Lakota conducted a ghost dance ritual on the reservation of Wounded Knee, South Dakota, and, and the army attempted to subdue them, viewing the ghost dance movement as a violent uh, terrorist group, more or less. Um, gunfire erupted in December of, uh, 29th of 1890 during this attempt to try to subdue the ghost dance movement, and soldiers killed, uh, or the estimates are up to 300 Native Americans, mostly men, women, and ch oh, older men, women, and children in what's known as the Wounded Knee Massacre. And according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the Indian wars under the government of the United States have been actually more than 40 in number. They've cost the lives of about 19,000 white men, women, and children, uh, and, the, and the lives of about 30,000 Native Americans. The actual number of killed and wounded Americans must be very much higher than the number given. 50% additional would be a safe estimate, and that's according to the U.S. Census Bureau itself. Um, following these uh, these these conflicts, uh, the United States Congress passed the Dawes Severalty Act, which divided up reservation land from tribal organization into individual allotments, um, and it granted citizenship to in Native American individuals. Um, remember, they were not granted uh, citizenship to the United States, uh, so Native Americans who severed their relationships with tribal authorities were granted citizenship. So the Dawes Act. Um, both broke up tribal sovereignty over, by breaking up land and incur, incentivized people to leave their tribal uh, units in order to gain U.S. citizenship and the protections of the due process and equal protection. And then furthermore, the Curtis Act of 1898 sorry, uh, abolished all tribal governance. And this was an attempt to break down kind of the organized political units of the Native American tribes. In the 20th century, things started to change in some respect, at least when on the question of legality. In 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act granted citizenship to all Native Americans born after its passage, but this meant that those who did not qualify uh, had to wait until the Nationality Act of 1940, which gave all Native Americans uh, American citizenship. There was also some movement to restore tribal sovereignty. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 um, ended the individual division of reservation land and restored self-governance of these reservations to the tribes. Um, additionally, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act of 1975 um, provided for, uh, uh, shifted the, the, the self-management of education and tribal and reservation management away from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to the tribal governments themselves. Along with the civil rights and uh, movements the, in the gen uh, in the second wave of feminism, the, uh, um, the new social movements also involved Native American uh, and indigenous rights movements. In 1969, a, a pan-Indian movement uh, occupied Alcatraz Island in San Francisco, demanding federal recognition of their rights. This occupation remained in force for over a year, and they issued a pro proclamation um, in which uh, they write, I'm quoting from it now, we, the Native, to the great white father and all his people. We, the Native Americans, reclaim this land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. We wish to be fair and honorable with our dealing with Caucasian inhabitants of this land, and hereby offer the following treaty. We will purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24 in glass beads and red cloth, a precedent set by the white man's purchase of a similar island 300 years ago. We know that $24 in trade goods for these 16 acres is more than was paid when Manhattan Island was sold, but we know that land values have risen over the years. And you can see the parody in, in, in satire here. We feel that this so-called, back this to the proclamation, so-called Alcatraz Island is more than suitable as an Indian reservation as determined by the white man's own standards. By this, we mean that this place resembles most Indian reservations in that, one, it is isolated from modern facilities, two, it has no fresh running water, three, the sanitation facilities are inadequate, four, there are no oil or mineral rights, five, there is no industry, so unemployment is very great, six, there is no health care facilities, seven, the soil is rocky and non-productive, Eight, there are no educational facilities. Nine, the population has always been held as prisoners and kept dependent upon others. Further, it would be fitting that the symbolic that ships from all over the world entering the Golden Gate would first see Indian land and thus be reminded of the true history of nation, uh, of this nation. So 
again, you can see like many like the Santa Clara Declaration, like uh, Frederick Douglass's "What to a Slave," that these these the is a uh, movement struggling for recognition and full legal and civil equality um, it, within the United States often appeal to the kind of language of the, uh, of the United States, and they are often rhetorically using this kind of satire and irony. Uh, eventually, this this occupation was ended when um, the government cut off running water and electricity to uh, to to the island, and the and the group was forced to disperse. Uh, a more radical group of the American Indian movement in the 1970s um, began occupying uh, federal buildings. And, and in 1973, they occupied the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs offices in D.C. And in 1974, they occupied two. Uh, uh, the town of Wounded Knee, uh, which led to confrontation with protesters and the FBI uh, and U.S. Marshals, which led to violent gunfire exchange. Um, two pro activists were killed and one U.S. Marshal was injured. Uh, more recently, um, Native American indigenous rights organizations have uh, centered around protesting pipelines, such as the Keystone XL pipeline and the Dakota Access pipeline. So you might have seen the hashtag no dapple. Um, this began in 2016 to protest the Dakota Access pipeline that would tr run between oil fields in West and North Dakota to um, to refineries in uh, in Missouri and Mississippi. Uh, and the protest was that um, this was going to run uh, near the Standing Rock Reservation and over traditional tribal burial lands and risk contaminating the groundwater of the Standing Rock uh, Indian Reservation. And so many Native Americans and indigenous activists, uh, as well as their allies, occupied the land try and blocked the um, the, 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 the progress of the pipeline. And these became um, highly publicized uh, when uh, activists began distributing videos of the ways in which uh, attack dogs and water and, 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 and water um, cannons were used to disperse protesters throughout 2016. Uh, ultimately, um, in 2016, President Obama um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers under Obama denied an easement for construction of the pipeline under the Missouri R River. Um, and kind of like uh, pushing, uh, kind of stalling the project. But in 2017, President Trump signed an executive order that reversed the Obama uh, the Obama order and advanced the construction of the pipeline, um, expediting the environmental review um, and kind of moving forward. So that, and as you saw from the Nick Estes piece, right, that this is uh, this this struggle for against uh, environmental destruction and environmental racism, um, at least in Estes' words, is linked to this broader struggle of indigenous activists in North America to um, maintain land sovereignty. This is a practice of land sovereignty against the against the settler colonial state of the United States. Um, and the, the struggle for recognition is not is, is not just a struggle for equal political rights, but is a struggle for um, sovereignty over the land that was theirs. In another respect, um, uh, queer folk have also um, engaged in, in, in struggles of recognition throughout uh, in the United States. Uh, for many period, for a long period of history in the United States, discrimination against queer folk was codified in laws that made homosexuality illegal, um, as well as required psychiatric tr treatments because homosexuality was considered a mental disease. And this open uh, discrimination against LGBTQ people meant that many kept their sexual orientation private and secret. And, uh, and this is the origin of the idea that in the closet, um, this made political organizing different, uh, more difficult um, because it uh, because of the the um, need for secrecy and privacy. However, uh, the Medicine uh, Society in 1950 was created to give closeted gay men organizing power and advocate against police abuse and police entrapment. Um, uh, cases in the 1950s. Um, in the 1960s, the gay and lesbian rights movements became more assertive and mo more radical. Um, in 1962, gay Philadelphians demonstrated in front of Independence Hall. Um, in 1966, transgender prostitutes who were tried of police who, who were uh, Tired of police harassment, rioted in San Francisco, um, and, and and violence erupted in New York City in Greenwich Village at the Stonewall Inn, in, w in which um, New York City police attempted to arrest customers at the at the gay bar, the Stonewall, um, and gay uh, and, and gay lesbian and transgender people resisted um, the the arrest and fent off police. Um, Police arrest for many, um, and the, which kind of inspired the modern gay rights movement. Um, these riots persisted over several nights, and the, and from this kind of emerged both more radical and more visible uh, gay rights movements. The origin of uh, kind of gay pride movements, gay liberation fronts, this language of liberation and pride and power, um, not just kind of e civil inequality. 
In the 80s, um, LGBTQ rights activism um, focused on the AIDS, the AIDS epidemic, um, which uh, was ravaged uh, both the African American community and the, uh, the, the, gay, the gay community throughout the 80s. And many, uh, many historians, sociologists, and activists accused the Reagan administration uh, of basically dragging its feet and, and refusing to take action on, a, on AIDS because of both the homophobia and, and racism, um, given the, the disproportionate effect that the AIDS epidemic had on, 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 on the gay and the black communities. In result of the failure of federal action to take seriously um, uh, the AIDS pandemic, um, Larry Kramer uh, founded the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, known, also known as ACT UP. Um, and this movement uh, worked, try, um, worked to both gain funding for AIDS research, but also to protest um, the silence around the AIDS pandemic and, and, to, kind of, and to put political pressure on um, the failure of elected officials to take, to take the AIDS epidemic seriously and to uh, protect, gain, uh, uh, protect these communities. In the, in the 1990s and 21st century, um, the terrain of gay rights shifted in, um, to, to equality in a, in, in, in a more legal sense, including um, equality to serve in the armed forces. In 1994, Don't Ask, Don't Tell kind of shifted the policy, um, the, 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 the longstanding policy prohibiting homosexual, um, um, member, homosexual people to serve in the armed services. Don't Ask, Don't Tell passed under the Clinton administration made it um, illegal for off, uh, commanding officers to inquire about one's sexual or orientation as the idea to protect um, uh, sort of gay and lesbian service members from discharge. However, it did uh, kept keep in laws place in place prohibiting homosexuality, which basically encouraged all military um, officers to be uh, to keep, stay in the closet until this eventually was overturned in, 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 uh, in the 2000s. In 2006, uh, the Supreme Court ruled in Lawrence versus Texas um, that, that, same, that state laws that criminalize same-sex intercourse were, were unconstitutional. And then the fight moved towards marriage equality, um, which began at the state level in which um, activists were able to get early victories, with, such as Massachusetts legalizing state marriage. But more conservative states began to backlash and making uh, passing laws that declared these marriages illegal and that they would not recognize the marriages of other states. Um, this led to lawsuits that eventually made them way up to the Supreme Court, who ruled in, two in, in 2015 in Obergefell versus Hodges um, that, that, the, the, that there was a constitution that based on the equal protection um, provisions of the Constitution, um, that all states had to recognize, that the same-sex marriages had to be recognized in all states. States fought back um, with the Religious Freedom Restoration Acts that we talked about last, uh, or a few weeks ago, um, that created opportunities for individuals and businesses to discriminate against queer folk uh, under the defense that such uh, discrimination, was, uh, that, that they could not participate or support uh, same-sex marriages or civil unions on the basis that, of their religious expression. Um, more recently, uh, transgender rights has become more uh, an increasing focal point of, of, of LGBTQ activism. In, in one respect, uh, it concerns military service. Um, until 2016, there was a blanket ban on all transgender people from serving and enlisting, enlisting in the military. Um, but the Ash Carter under the Obama administration in 2000, on June 30th, 2016, allowed for uh, the, for 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 uh, transgender individuals in the United States military to serve in their identified or assigned genders. Uh, uh, however, um, more recently, uh, the Trump administration uh, passed a language that the the the, the transgender in, individuals uh, could own and um, could not serve as in their identified gender. At, uh, under the and under their identified gender in the armed services, uh, at the state level, um, many uh, much of the work has been focused on uh, attempts to get rid of um, discriminatory bathroom bills. That um, th these are state level initiatives that discriminate against trans people by legally mandating that all individuals can only use the restrooms of their biologically assigned sex. Uh, Gavin Grimm, an, uh, a young trans man from uh, Virginia, sued the Gloucester County School Board for his right to use the male bathroom at his school. Um, and, uh, and this was an attempt to apply Title IX protections about equal equality for educational institutions uh, to gender identity and not just sex. Uh, this case bounced around the court system with the courts really just applying Chevron deference. Um, I told you it would come back um, and, not, and not applying gender identity.
to Title IX, interpreting Title IX, especially because the once this got to the appellate level, uh, the Trump administration had made the Department of Education had made it clear that they were not interpreting Title IX to protect gender identity. Uh, eventually, a district court uh, ruled in favor of Grimm, uh, but this didn't. This district court ruling uh, did not rule about the law, but it did find that, that the school board discriminated against him and that and that uh, and required the school board to change his gender identity to male in all school records. Um, Turning to um, Hispanic and Latino Latinx uh, struggles for, for, for recognition, many Latinx people were incorporated into the United States during the annexation of Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado following the U.S.-Mexican War in 1848, as well as the incorporation of Puerto Rico as a ter territory after the Spanish-American War in 1898. Puerto Ricans were eventually granted citizenship during World War I through the Jones Act. Now, we've already talked about a lot of the material that the, um, the textbook discusses here, but recall back our reading of May Nye's piece on the creation of illegal immigration through the creation of numerical quotas, creation of deportation forces in order to uh, deport Mexican-American and Mexican immigrants into the United States um, who were above the quota, who, who lacked the proper, the, the, the appropriate visa status. Um, and in response to um, this, many, many Mexican Americans uh, who were working in the agricultural industry, which uh, became this key site of activism. In 1903, Mexican uh, American farm workers joined with Japanese American farm workers to form the, form the first agricultural union. In 1929, the Latin civil rights activists formed the League of United Latin American Citizens uh, to, to, to um, advocate for the equal civil and political and legal rights of all of all um, Latin American citizens. In 1946, uh, no, sorry, in 1946, uh, activists sued California school districts to end the segregation of Mexican Americans in schools. The Supreme, or sorry, the U U.S. Court of Appeals ruled in Mendez versus uh, Westminster in 1947 that this segregation was indeed unconstitutional. And more, um, during the 1960s, the Chicano movement became animated, animated by the Black Power movements, began advocating for taking pride in the hybrid Latin and Native American cultural identity. And the goal here was to maintain bilingual education in both English and Spanish, and to preserve the the and to kind of highlight, reclaim Chicano, which was uh, for many older Latinx Americans was viewed as a um, a slur or derogatory claim, phrase, but to reclaim this uh, as a as a as a uh, point of pride for uh, Latinx Americans. Um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta uh, fought in the 1960s for the rights of Mexican American agricultural workers, inspired by Dr. King and the civil rights movements. They advocated for nonviolent uh, um, and direct action. They formed the United Farm Workers and organized um, a boy boycotts of, of crops, uh, specifically grapes that were grown uh, by um, far that were grown in California and throughout the West. Uh, by ag until the uh, until the rights of Mexican American agricultural workers. Um, were respected. And, and this is an excerpt from a 1984 speech but that Chavez gave. The Okay, sorry about that problem. Uh, blue jeans just crashed in the middle of recording this, so let's pick up where we left off. Um, this is an excerpt from uh, one of Cesar Chavez's speeches, and it was a 1984 speech to the Commonwealth Club of California. 
Um, and here, while he describes the United Farm Workers as first and foremost a union, he also emphasizes on the emphasis, uh, emphasizes the role of attacking injustice, uh, of, of uh, acknowledging that they had become victims in a democratic society and addressing this injustice, um, to realize the rights of Chicanos um, as Chicanos became more visible, um, began entering college in greater numbers, running for public office, and, and, and asserting their rights in a broad range of issues in many communities across the country. So again, appealing to this kind of same rhetoric of realizing America's democratic values. The last uh, uh, group that we'll focus on is Asian Americans. And um, for many Asian uh, American, there's the pervasive and pathological mythology of the Asian American model minority, that because Asian Americans are, um, according to demographic studies, are more wealthier and more highly educated than other minority, other uh, people of color in the United States, that they are the model minority. Um, however, this it betrays significant legacies of discrimination and domination. We talked about a few weeks ago in our discussion of immigration um, that the first, some of the first uh, limitations on immigration that this country passed were the exclusion of Chinese uh, immigrants um, through very racist stereotypes and tropes, as you can see in this political cartoon. Um, furthermore, again, the discrimination um, during World War II against Japanese Americans who were interned um, in, in basically concentration camps um, throughout the West for fear that their loyalty was actually to, uh, was to Japan. Um, this was upheld by the Supreme Court in the Korematsu decision. Um, discrimination that resurged in the Vietnam War and, and Asians, uh, Asian Americans of all ancestry, regardless of national origin, were discriminated against during the uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, and there and there was significant mobilization and activism. So once again, um, this has completely crashed on me. So I'm going to try to close out this class as quickly as possible. This is what we're talking about next class, the future of American politics. Um, and the discussion threads for this evening. Uh, consider the various struggles for recognition and equal rights that we've discussed today. What do they say about America's Republican and Democratic principles? Do they suggest the hypocr hypocrisy of American values or the ability of America to correct injustices over time? Or do they suggest something else? Reminder, 200 word posts replying to one discussion topics for this week are due by Friday at midnight and 100 word replies are due by Sunday at midnight. And that's it for uh, this. I apologize for the stop start towards the end of this lecture when my computer decided that it was done trying to be a supportive member of this teaching team. Uh, hopefully it's not too clunky. And uh, again, if you have any questions, if you have any uh, concerns, email me, drop into office hours, and I will do my best to help and support you to finish out the material for this class. Um, that's it for today. I will see you next time. Take care of yourselves.